So Dom actually calls himself the accidental academic. He was the first in his family to attend university um, and he's really passionate about driving educational outcomes for the Northern Transformation. Um, so as he will talk to you about, um, it's about creating a welcoming environment from learners of all different backgrounds. So I'll hand over to Dom to give you a bit of an update of the university's move to Inveresk. Some of you are probably quite aware of everything that's happening, um, but we're obviously pushing really well forward with all of our timelines and looking forward to um, some construction starting next year and working on the development of our academic model to support um, future offerings as well. Um, and he's going to drive a conversation tonight about what it means to be a university more connected to the city. So welcome, Dom. Thanks, Dom. Uh, so, it's a great opportunity to come along and talk tonight because, as Chelsea has said, I'm passionate about education, but um, people's motivations behind their passions probably need to have some context. So this is commonly referred to as Dirty Dublin, okay? And this is, I don't know if I get my thing to work. Oh, that was clever, Dominic. Is my thing working? It's not working, Never mind. So um, this area here is called North Dublin. So I'm a North Sider, and then I lived in North Geelong, and now I live in North uh, Launceston. So, and I lived in this area over here, a place called White Hall. The nearest university was around here, which is Trinity College Dublin. And Trinity College Dublin, most people don't realise that until 1964, uh, Catholics weren't allowed to attend it. Not that I'm in any way religious whatsoever, but the idea was that you were not allowed to attend it unless you were actually of Church of England or another faith. The closest university then after that one was out here, University College Dublin. It's one of the largest universities now in Europe. To get from here to here in those days was about a two hour bus ride. Um, Dublin is a pocket sized capital with very, very skinny roads. A bit like, um, I've just been, I'll just throw a few names around, I've just been to Bologna and the roads are very skinny there. Well, they were very skinny in Ireland except for the main street in Dublin called O'Connell Street. So what are, if you didn't, and you would never drive, people didn't have cars, but if you you'd either cycle or you'd go by public transport. So the concept of going to university when you came from the north side of Dublin was very, very minimal. And we had no idea about it. To give you another example, 118 of us finished year 12, and everybody finished year 12 in Ireland in those days, which is a great thing, but five of us went to university. So educational attainment, where I'm from, was very, very low. I was very, very lucky to get a, um, a scholarship to go to University College Dublin. But when we look back then, it was about 4%, it was around about 5%, it was about the, number, the percentage of people from the north side of the city that would attend university. It was around about 15% for the rest of the nation. So it was still pretty low. I checked up on the latest statistics um, last, last week. 48% of the Irish population between the ages of 22 and 36 now have a university degree. We're one of the most highly educated countries in the world. And the reason why is because they came up with the concept of place-based <laughs> universities, which we'll hear Rufus talk about quite frequently. But they were doing this back in the era of the Dawkins reviews that occurred in the late 19th, uh, a mid to late 1980s in Australia. And for out of sheer bizarreness, even though I traveled for two hours back and forth across the city every day to go to university, they built a university right here called Dublin City University, which is 200 metres from the lounge room floor where I was born and spent my, the first 21 years of my life. So it's just an interesting concept. Now, educational attainment in the north of Ireland, uh, sorry, the north of Dublin, the north of Ireland is pretty high as well. Our former F Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, um, Paddy Nixon, is now the Vice Chancellor of Ulster University, and he's big into educational attainment. So it's now skyrocketed right across the country. A lot of injection of money, it's thing called uh, the European Union. Yeah, that's what it was. Lots of about something like $50 billion over a period of about 20 years was invested in education and various sort of things. So if you invest in education, you do get outcomes. So well, what's the vision for Tasmania, for, for Lutrubita? So we want to draw on the uniqueness of Tasmania's assets, we'll call them. I'll sound like a businessman. We'll talk about its assets. It's got a... Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button there. And that's not going to work, so we'll leave that one. Um, we want to serve the island's future. So educational attainment in Tasmania is very, very low as we speak. And it has been for very, very many years. It's one of the lowest in Australia. So the idea here is that we want to serve the future of the industries that we currently have, and also those industries that we don't even know exist yet. 
We also want to make it a sustainable place. We have the lovely name of being clean and green, or lean and clean and green. And on top of that, we also want to be able to maintain that brand, if you like, of having high quality produce and a high quality experience. Doing thing, vital things from Tasmania to the world. Um, you know, every, if, if those of you who know about universities, there's all the things to do with rankings. We're not overly interested in that these days, but what we are interested in is doing things that influence the rest of the world. So for example, we've got the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies down in Hobart, as well as in Lonnie at the moment. We've also got um, the uh, TIA, the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture. We've also got the Australian Maritime College here in Launceston. These are all world-reaching parts of the university. And then finally, it's a place of places, and that's probably where the university is going. We are becoming truly a university of place-based learning. We have a campus in Hobart, or campuses in Hobart. We're having a campus in Launceston, campus in Burnie. And we also have outreach sites. For example, we're involved with the West Coast Hub over in ASEAN at the moment, and that's going in leaps and bounds. There's lots and lots of students enrolling and using the space to try and connect with TAFE, connect with university and further study. I mentioned earlier on that we've got the lowest educational attainment, or one of the lowest attainments in the, in the country. So if you look at Australia as a, or if you look at the ACT, then we know that's full of public servants, so you know, that's always going to have a high level of education, okay, so 45%. But really Tasmania is quite low, and then if you look at northern Tasmania, it's around about 20%. When you go over towards Burnie and the northwest coast, it goes down below 15% and it drops precipitously outside of those areas. That's the reason why we're trying to create little spots, if you like, around the, country, around the state where we can actually interact with students who, and try and encourage them to even just dip their toe in the water of education. Um, so again, and note what I said that in Ireland now, the proportion of 20 to 36 year olds with a degree is about 48%. Now we're never going to get there. Well, unless, unless something phenomenal happens, but if we can increase that percentage participation by five or ten percent over the next twenty years, I think we'd have done a fantastic job. So, um, and I'm sorry for those of you who may have seen some of these slides before, but today's students learn differently. Um, I've had conversations with some of my older colleagues, and even some of my colleagues that are my age, and they still live in the era where, in the 1980s, before the invention of a thing called the internet. It's happy birthday to the internet. It's 30 years old this year, 1989. It feels as if it's been around for everybody's lives, but it's only 1989. Facebook is only 10 years old, I think it is, or 12 years old. So um, you came into this university in the morning at 8.30. 8 you did your classes all day. You went over and had a bite to eat in the cafeteria, and then you went off to the library for a couple of hours, and then you went home. Um, nowadays... Oh. I, I was being nice. I'm, I was referring to Australian students, not Irish students, okay? So they want, they want a mix of everything. They want snackable learning, is the term that came out recently. They want to be able to take bites of bits of information, and they want to stack it. They want to turn that into a, a unit or a course of study. But basically what we find is that students will spend about a third of their time at the university campus, if it's an on-campus course, a third of their time or it could be very hard to say a third of their time, a third of their time online, and then a third of their time in work integrated learning. And I suppose I'll just drop in the comment is that many people in Launceston don't realize that around about 90% of our students who are studying degree level courses are engaged in professional courses. Nursing, uh, social work, architecture, engineering, education, um, laboratory medicine, exercise science, all of those are externally accredited accredited courses that allow students to be, have a bit of an edge, if you like, on getting a job. And we will continue to offer courses that increase the employment prospects of the people of the north of the state. Um, today's campus, I'll say that I'm, I'm sounding like a very, like a scratched record, but basically if we, I say that the lecture theatre will only exist for as long as my generation of academics. People no longer, students no longer want to stay, um, go into a room, sit down in a tiered lecture theatre and listen to some old boring old fogey like me lecture for 45 minutes to an hour. Noting, that, of course, that all the studies around the world show that students retain around about 50% of the first 10 to 15 minutes, about 25% of the next 10 to 15 minutes and absolutely stuff all of the remaining part of the lecture. So why bother? 
Okay, so we're going to talk more about having creative learning spaces. Okay, creative learning spaces, interactive spaces where there's peer-to-peer -peer learning. We're going to create spaces where they talk about the flipped classroom. In other words, we will give content to the students online or in other forms, but then they will come in and have more of a tutorial-based learning experience. Also, immersive experiences out in, you know, for example, if we're doing wilderness studies, we will take them out into the wilderness. You know, we will, and for example, the business school here, and I'm not going to take away any of Gemma's thunder, but the idea is that we put nurses in hospitals to learn how to be nurses. We put doctors in there. We put teachers in school classrooms. Why don't we put business people inside the central business district? You know, it's a bit of a no-brainer when you think about it, really. Well, I don't think it's a no -brainer. So, um, the intent for um, the Northern Transformation, and as, as Chelsea alluded to earlier on, my, view, my impression of the building is I really couldn't care less, but the idea of actually getting up to 10,000 students, people engaged with the northern campuses over the next 20 to 30 years, to me, is the exciting part of it. But they're not all going to be coming straight out of school. And in fact, you may have heard Rufus refer to the fact of trying to remove ATAR, the tertiary entrance score rank, as a, as a barrier to getting into university. So yes, we'll certainly have our Tasmanian school leavers with our, their ATARs, but we will also have mature age students offering them the vast majority, that this will be likely to be the biggest growth area, trying to bring people who left school early back into the fold by training them up, by making sure that they're not just being dropped into university, but we will have preparatory courses for them, we already do, but we'll have better ones that will allow these students to succeed. Other group is interstate students. We lose, say we lose, a quarter or a fifth of Tasmanian school leavers choose to go to the mainland to study. And why not? You know, island states, small cities, why not go and experience the big smoke? But there has to be an equivalent number of people from the big smokes around Australia who want to come to a place like Tasmania and experience the wilderness, experience the friendliness of the state. So we are working really, really hard on trying to bring in these groups of students. International students, again, we want to have around about, it's around about 20% of our students, I think, are international. And as a result, not only do they bring money to the university, and we'll all know of all this, this, this stuff on the ABC and whatever over the last couple of years, but they also bring culture to a small city like Launceston or a small city like the cradle, uh, Burnie and the Cradle Coast. The whole idea here is that we're getting a overall, and we're giving them a cultural experience as well. So, but we're going to target those students in different courses or in selected courses rather than the usual ones that we just load up in certain areas because we know we'll get numbers in them. And then finally, we're going to export. So basically, online courses, short courses, whatever the case may be. Many of you may or may not know, but we're the largest single provider of online postgraduate nursing education in Australasia. So there's about 4,000 of them we've got as students, but they're fully online and they're studying specialist courses in nursing. So we already are, we're the fourth largest provider, a fourth or fifth largest provider of online education in Australia, full stop, right across the board. So lots of things that people don't really know about the university that we just silly enough not to tell people. Um, so the design principles, we're going through some incredibly in-depth and quite <laughs> um, detailed design principles, both with the academic staff, we have co-design workshops with the community and various other groups. So we're trying to get a, a campuses that are well connected, integrated with the city, supporting the development. The official title of the Inveresque site is not the, new, the Inveresque campus, it is the Inveresque Cultural and Educational Precinct. That's the official title, am I correct? That's what I was told it was. I don't know, you all work for the council. <laughs> and it's going to support the QV MAG and its operations. It's going to support the Big Picture School. It's going to support the uh, current operations of creative arts and media, of architecture and design. People forget that we've had a presence at Inveres now for over uh, 18 years. So the idea is that we are going to consolidate the site rather than to, uh, basically create an entirely new campus. We won't talk about parking. And then it's going to support regional outreach activities. So we will be supporting the West Coast along with the Cradle Coast campus people. 
And to create a successful campus, it has to be 24-7 or near enough to 24-7, okay? It has to have, be community activated. And the whole idea is that we want to have the University of Tasmania in little letters, not the great big lines that we currently have. Um, we want people to, fight, to, to be inviting. We want people to come into the spaces and use them. The bottom floors of most of the new bu buildings will be open to the public. We will hopefully they will be able to use those facilities. And the idea is that the grounds, should I use my architecture speak that I've been told, urban realm, mm -hmm. um, will be of a suitable quality that will bring people on and we hope to run functions and so on. Basically, and we've also got the capacity to co-locate with other groups of people. So we've got to work with industry groups as well. Um, just as a quickie, um, we're put, putting up three buildings. This one here is the DA has been approved by both council and has gone through the tribunal without any appeals. The bridge was approved by council last Thursday and then there's I think it's three weeks for which the appeals can go through. I can't really see anybody appealing about having a, a pedestrian bridge across the water, but never mind. The next build will be what they're calling the learning and teaching building. I like to call it the arts humanities building. And then finally, the biggest build, and the most complex build, and the most expensive build, will be at Willow Street, which will be the Science and Health Sciences building. And that will also house the Launceston Research Institute. So that's the three builds. We hope the whole lot will be done by, and I'm going to flick through those pictures because you can see those on the web. It's going to be done by hopefully early 2024. It'll be a staged build. That way, and we're talking about having a prosperous city, well, the idea is that if we were to do it all in one hit, we wouldn't be employing Tasmanians to build it, or con Tasmanian uh, contractors. Now, we're at the build-up in West Park and Cradle Coast is being done by local builders, so it's in Tasmanian builders. Likewise, if we stage this build, we'll be able to have a, an apprenticeship pipeline that will provide into the future in the area of complex wood-built structures, and will also be employing primarily, we hope, Tasmanians at a very, very minimum, Australians, but the whole idea is that we won't have them to fly in, fly out, lots and lots of workers put up these buildings. Um, what it will also add is that students are not the ones that you just find drunken on your doorstep with you know, uh, uh, parking cones on their heads and stuff like that. They are actually usually uh, intelligent uh, people who uh, really, really want to learn. So, uh, they also bring vibrancy to a city. So if we even have you know, a couple of extra thousand students living and wandering around the city's, uh, city of Launceston and likewise a few hundred extra students, for example, over the next few years in Burnie, this activates the place. We're put, going to put up around about, oh, I think it's about four, total we'll have about 400 students living in the city. And that, well, that brings safety. So when you, like for example, people say, oh, what about the safety of Inverest campus or Inverest cultural and educational precinct? The idea here is, is that people will actually be able to, there'll always be people around. You're going to have students living on site, so the place will always be activated. And am I, have I spoken for too long? Yeah, and, and I know, yeah, so, um, this is where we are. So please visit the station cottage, which is, it looks like the old train station for those of you, and of course, most, for those of you who are locals, you'll know that it was only built about 20 years ago, but it was built to look like a train station. And we're there all the time. Somebody's always going to be there and we can always have a chat with you and also just visit the website. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll stand up. Um, so yeah, I was really delighted to get a phone call from Chelsea last week about um, coming along tonight to share with you um, the experience that the College of Business and Economics has had this year so far in launching our Accelerated Bachelor of Business. So for those of you that may not be familiar with this particular course, um, the Bachelor of Business or Bachelor of Commerce as it was then has been offered in Launceston for a long time. Um, I'm not sure of the exact number of years, but decades. It was what I actually did myself as a student about 15 years or so ago. Um, time travels quick, doesn't it? Um, so it's, it's always been in Launceston, but over the years I have certainly noticed as then a student and now certainly as, a, as an academic teaching into that program, that our numbers, if you like, and our, um, our success as a program in Launceston has faded away. So when I was asked uh, about a year ago by our Dean if I would be interested in joining a working group to put forward an idea around changing something about the Launceston business offering so that it was unique and different and it was trans potentially transformative, 
um, for our university and for our students, um, I was really excited. So that was about a year or so ago. Um, of course, the decision was made fairly quickly to try and launch the program or to launch the program this year and that's exactly what we did. I, um, being my sort of organised um, rigid self, would have liked a little bit longer to plan things um, but we, we, we acted while the iron was hot if you like and we decided late last year that we would launch the program at the start of this year. What that meant is that we actually had already an existing cohort of students who had already applied for the Bachelor of Business in Launceston which was when they applied a three-year degree so we needed to obviously one of our first um, tasks was to communicate with that cohort of students and obviously explain that the degree had changed to being a two-year fast-track program. And what that has meant is what we've done is um, the course is, is still the same in terms of the number of units our students complete, the majors that they have to choose from or the areas of specialisation as we also call them, um, and the, the length even if of those units is, is the same, but instead of doing two main 13 week semesters a year, our students are doing three what we're calling accelerated study periods, um, and they're starting earlier in the year, so they start at the beginning of February instead of the last week of February and they study right through until this year it's going to be the 13th of December and then they'll have their exams just before Christmas. They still get a fairly decent summer break um, which was an intentional decision by us. Some of you might be familiar with other accelerated programs that are offered either at UTAS or around the country and in some of those cases students are actually studying over that typical Christmas sort of New Year period into January which makes it somewhat challenging I think when everyone else is often relaxing and enjoying some time off work um, our students can be right in the thick of it. So the way that we've designed the program I think is working really well. Um, I guess uh, to give you a little bit in terms of how we're actually delivering that program I guess there's two key aspects to the program. The first is that it is an accelerated program and it, it is only offered in Launceston and it is only offered in on-campus mode. So that does, um, I guess, I was just looking through some surveys today that we've done with our students and a couple of them had suggested that it'd be nice to have an online option, but um, we're talking about bringing students into Launceston to give them an experience in Launceston and all of those things are much better delivered in an on-campus mode where we can and support that as Don was saying with some online materials and, and experiences as well. Um, so the first aspect, it's accelerated, it's two years instead of three. The second key aspect of our program is that we also made the decision to take our classes out of Newnham and trial something in the city. And that's probably the most um, significant thing to talk about tonight. So uh, what we did is, is through, um, I guess, the, the drive and the um, enthusiasm of our dean and our senior management team, we started looking for um, space and that coincided with discussions also around um, potential partners, I guess, that we could co potentially co-locate with. Um, those of you that are familiar with the program would know, like Bruce, for instance, who came and spoke with the students, would know that we were originally located down in Patterson Street with Enterprise, who are the main um, tenants of this building. And Enterprise obviously being uh, an initiative designed to support the startup community in Launceston worked really well for our students in terms of exposing them to real entrepreneurs, um, people with not necessarily business qualifications but certainly the business expertise and experience of starting their own business. So we were initially in Patterson Street and it was just um, only uh, recently when the Macquarie House site became obviously available to use that we moved here with Enterprise. So the arrangement is that we're currently hiring or renting that space from Enterprise um, through a venue hire agreement. Um, our students, I think it's fair to say, are really enjoying not only being in the city but being in this fabulous building in the heart of what I consider as a, as a resident a really vibrant place of Launceston. I think the transformation of this civic square has been excellent. Um, so they're studying here, their classes. Um, we obviously don't, as you would have known when you walked up the space, we don't have um, offices here for our staff. So our staff are traveling um, from wherever they would normally base. Some of those are obviously based at Newnham, but we're also using staff that are actually industry people themselves that are employed with us through some sort of casual arrangement to come and deliver classes and that works well having our presence in the city uh, for that reason. So staff are um, not based here but obviously come in here and, and teaching the classes to our students. Um, I'm conscious of time um, but I guess uh, just to give you some 
insight into some of the experiences um, and, and other reasons behind this uh, decision to trial this. And I should say it is, it's not a trial in the sense that we plan to go back to Newnham, but it is something that we understand is not necessarily going to be a permanent arrangement. We don't own this space. And obviously once the new campus is available and online, our intention would be to move into that campus space. Um, but I think it's a really good um, opportunity for us to start to, to strengthen the relationships that we have with industry and business in the city. And Don mentioned that before. Um, so another key thing that we did early on was meet with the Launceston Chamber of Commerce a number of times and, and keep them informed about our plans and what was happening. And they were, as you would probably expect, very supportive of us uh, coming into the city and uh, having our students in the city. We have currently around 50 students that started at the beginning of this year and we've just accepted a second intake at the start of this current study period of around 20. A lot of those 20 that have just started are actually international students. So we didn't have a lot of international students at the start of the year because of the timing of our study periods and, and usual travel um, plans and so forth. But we do have a, a really good um, or a growing, if you like, cohort of international students, which I think is really great. And in fact, we had an event with our Business and Economic Student Society last Thursday evening in Macquarie House. Um, we had a couple of industry speakers come along and the majority of people in that um, audience were actually international students. And it was really great to talk to them afterwards and actually you know, share their enthusiasm for trying to be part of the community. They want the opportunities to meet people. I think potentially it might be quite isolating to be located away from, from the activity um, in accommodation and so forth. So coming into the city and, and being in a great space like this gives them something about, tells them something about Launceston, but also exposes them to a lot more people. And that's not just, of course, the international students, that's all of our students. And I think that's one of our key strengths is that we can do that. Um, I guess the other thing is about, again, what Dom was referring to in terms of the way in which students learn is changing. So very much within our College of Business and Economics, we are trying to drive that cultural change away from that traditional two hour lecture, one hour tutorial type schedule that I pretty much had, I think, and Chelsea as well, because we studied together all throughout our degree and actually using more uh, flexible style teaching and interactive, you know, student led um, delivery. So we can do that now with online and technology. We've got so much, you know, resource there that we can use smartly and we can then therefore reserve the precious time that our students I think have to come to class for that, interactive, that interaction with not only us as lecturers but their peers and also with industry people. So that's where we're, we're also heading and I think spaces um, obviously like this one but also ultimately the new space that we'll have at Inveresk in a few years time will be designed around that. And students, again, they say that. I was looking at comments today from them through the student survey, and they're the types of things that they're asking for. Um, a lot of them are working, in our degree at least, a lot of them are working. So, you know, if they're going to come and spend three hours or so per unit that they're studying on campus with people, they want it to be, you know, useful time. Um, I think if they sit in a lecture theatre and listen to someone talk for two hours then there's no reason why they couldn't perhaps have read that information or listened to it online at another time. So having that interaction, bringing people in and then also of course sending our students out into the community is um, really I think you know possible by having us in the city and in the CBD. It's not something that is that easy. I'm, it's hard enough to try and explain to people where my office is at Newnham campus, let alone perhaps where a lecture theatre might be um, for them to come and speak at. So having these, you know, very um, recognisable spaces, which I, you know, I truly believe the university will be once we're out, when all of us are at Inveresk. Um, so Joji is next to share his experience and he's one of our current students and moved to Launceston from Melbourne. Yay! <laughs> he's studying our design engineering with us. Um, and as I said, he's recently elected as the North TU president. Um, his hobbies include creating fun times on social media using memes. <laughs> and he's in a chat with you about what it's like to live at Inveresk at the moment um, and also about what the student interactions will be like with the city post move from his experience and in chatting with current students. So it'd be great to hear his first hand experiences. Over to you. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, you're an EMC student, correct? Yeah. What do you study? Logistics. Where did you come from? I'm actually a 
Oh, from Beerport. That's yeah. nice. See, in AMC, most of us are not from uh, Tasmania. We are mainly from interstate. I come from Melbourne. Sixty percent of us come from Brisbane. So, so I don't know elsewhere. And then the question was raised: What does a university city look like? In the interstate, we see the city as the university city, like Uni Melbourne, Deakin, RMIT. They huge concrete jungles. That's what that's what I like to call them. And the thing is, the uh, traveling between from here, from home to universities, I couldn't take it. I was offered a. Uh, call, uh, to study at Uni Melbourne or come down to Launceston. I chose here. I've never been here before. I just, because AMC is here. That's why I came. And when I came down, I saw, wow, <laughs> this place is really small. <laughs> 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 but, but the thing is, I loved it. I loved the small. You know, everything's close by. You know everyone much better. And that's in the Newnham. So Inveres might be, I say even worse. No, it's so small. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Uh, but also, when I look at that question, I think of two things. First of all, is when what uni of uh, what uni Melbourne's like, the vibrant city in Melbourne is. It's concrete. It's everything. It's busy. It's populated. It's annoying. But also the second thing, I don't want to throw any under Utah stuff under the bus, is I think of Hobart, the situation that arises there. The leaving crisis, the flooding. And me, it's taken a role as the president, I, I didn't want it to happen up here as well. So, sorry, what was the second part you wanted me to talk about? Um, just the experience of the current students at Inveresk so the current experience, I was talking to a few Inveresk uh, students, was that uh, it was, um, they feel very, how do I put it? Sorry about this, <laughs> be mind blank. Uh, uh, it's very small, it's a very small community though. It's, everyone knows each other. But even if, when the move happens and occurs, it's gonna stay the same. That's what I think most of us who study in up here, especially, loves about this place. It's so small, it's so connected. You connect with everything here. And, uh, and then we can access you know, so many hiking trips so easily, so many camping. And uh, I think that's what the University City in Launceston will be like. And from a student point of view, I think it's, it's a wonderful experience because Launceston is no other. Thank you. Sorry, Captain Sean. <laughs> and I'll hand over to Casey. So he graduated from UTAS with a Bachelor of Human Movement in 1999. And worked in the fitness industry. Um, he's been a primary school health and PA teacher and is now Director of Student Engagement and Lecturer in Health and PA. As we said, he's really passionate about promoting um, active lifestyle and is going to chat about um, his vision for active transport around the city. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak and thank you everyone for coming out. I would like to ask a favour, if you could please just stand up, give yourself a break from sitting. I'm glad you changed that, that was very fair. <laughs> so, hypothetical, you're on the phone to a close friend from New South Wales and their son or daughter is considering coming and studying in Launceston at the University of Tasmania. They're interested in perhaps maritime studies or business and a very good education program, but they're unsure. And they ask you a question, how do Tasmanians travel? How do they commute? What are their travel habits like? Have a quick chat to the person beside you and then we'll talk about it. How might you answer that question? Ah, oh, terrific. That's quite to say. 
Okay, thank you. Feel free to stay standing or you're welcome to sit back down. Um, what did we come up with here, gentlemen? Um, I guess from my personal experience, I drive almost everywhere. Who shares that perspective? Would you say that mainly, not, not you, but Tasmanians travel by car? Yes. yes. It's habit, it's their routine, because that's how the environment's designed. The environment is designed for car traffic and parking where people want to park easily um, and accessibly. I would argue that the environment is, parts of the environment are built very well for what's called, what I would call active travel, but people don't have to do that because they can drive. And that's the mentality. Anyone else come up with anything different? Lots. Terrific. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm excited to be able to talk to you about a great opportunity. And I think what a university city might look like, there's an opportunity for the University of Tasmania and Launceston to be the leaders in health and active travel. What about if your friend said, oh, I'm not sure they've got enough money to afford a car. Oh, don't come to Tasmania then? Is that what you tell them? No. What about um, my gen gentleman over here? I'd say probably get an e-bike or a bicycle. Okay, fantastic. So I think there's a great opportunity for the university to capitalise on active travel and I think having a university city in the location that it's based provides the great foundation for that to happen. I want to turn you, I was in Hobart today presenting on this same topic and I showed pictures of Riverbend. Okay, so many years ago when I first came to Launceston made the big move from the northwest coast, uh, that was just space and dirt, but have a look at it now. So Seaport and what's come from Seaport. Royal Park, we can connect through to Stillwater. Hey, there's some accommodation there now. That can go through to the gorge. Penny Royal's reinvigorated. And then that bridge, what a terrific move. No cars on it. And look at the, the opportunities that's opened. Socially, physically, benefiting the environment. And again, I think with inverse opportunities, the same thing can occur there, very close to the city. So the location's great. And I think some of the points you raised, Sue, are very, are very pertinent to active travel. So I think Hobart, we're a little bit jealous of what's happened at Riverbend, that path by the river where nobody used to go. It was a bit of an eyesore. Now there's foot traffic, there's bike traffic, and what's happening? There's social capital. It's bringing life. It's bringing community. It's a terrific example. So perhaps let's think about how that might be able to happen on the other side of the river. So, very quickly, active transport. Now this first thing I want to prelude, this is not about no cars. We all have cars. Most people drive everywhere. I certainly drove here tonight. It's not about no cars, but it's about getting people to rethink how they might travel. So. Key points underpinning my passion for active travel, and hopefully this is shared, first of all is about health. Now I'm talking mentally, emotionally, socially, bringing people together through active travel. I'm not sure that many people look that happy when they're driving. They just want to get there quickly, right? But you see people even running, bad, walking, <laughs> or commuting on a bike, and I don't know that they look that unhappy because they're engaging and interacting with the environment and the community around them. Terrific, it gives a sense of belonging. Even better, doing it with other people, other students. So right on the doorstep here of the city, in Varesk, I think there'll be plenty of students coming and engaging with the city. We want, we want students in the city. Social capital, the other um, worry for me is the empty shops around the place. So I'll touch on the economic benefit a minute. So first, it's about health, but let's just not think physically. I think the media or people think bikes, walking, it's all physical, but it's so much more than that. Culture, you already told me about the culture, we drive. And I wanna park right in front of Myers when I'm going to Myers. <laughs> People think like that. And look, I take your point about parking. Parking's a factor, it's gonna be a factor, absolutely. Um, 
in the city, there's lots of places to park, but maybe let's just walk a little way once we park. Very accessible and mobile city, so let's capitalise on that. Let's change the culture for us, for these people, through active behaviour. Stimulates the mind as well. I think our friend from New South, did I say New South Wales, who can't afford a car, I think there's lots of... Um, questions perhaps around the economic benefit I should have brought it along tonight there's a great document called good business and act that's by the Hart Foundation good business active travel actually brings business to the city so there's some so exciting things going on at the moment with the city of Launceston and some things being proposed I think probably there's this mindset of if we take cars away then that will be bad for my business, people won't come to my business, where I would actually argue people coming in actively through active transport is good economically. And there's evidence from the Heart Foundation to support that. Um, this is a great opportunity. So I think socially, benefit of our wonderful environment that we have here, it'd be lovely to see people actively transporting and traveling um, by the river over, over this side. What's that, the South Esk, is it? Yep, okay. North Esk, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. I'm not from Launceston originally, so. Um, but seeing people over there and some social capital. So I think really there's some exciting opportunities. So I would love to say that the University of Tasmania in Launceston is leading active travel through their university city. They're promoting healthy behaviour, they're bringing people together, and there's lots of benefit in that. And the other good news is active behaviour generally stimulates the mind so it makes people smarter there's no question about that um, <laughs> um, so look I think I think that's enough from me but um, people might get a little bit of an insight into this there's uh, some work happening with the city of Launceston at the moment on Christmas parade day on the 7th of December and there'll be an opportunity to see what an active city might look like with some of the streets remaining closed following the Christmas parade 7th of December so make sure you come into the city that day, enjoy the Christmas parade, and there'll be an opportunity to walk on the streets or use your skates or however, or um, my gentleman with the helmet over here, you've, you've got your bike? You've got your bike? Yeah, <laughs> we'll bring your bike on the 7th of December. Um, and uh, the city of Launceston are gonna be launching their, their transport vision soon. So I know they're very big on AFTI travel. And once again, I think that's for me a, a big part of what a university city looks like. Thank you. Thank you.